Hello and good morning friends, welcome to the CEC EduSet live lecture to all the uh, viewers of uh, CEC EduSet net network as well as uh, to all the viewers who watch us regularly through YouTube, wishing you a very very happy new year. Dear friends, we would uh, like to tell you all uh, that uh, we are here for you again uh, with the new objectives, uh, but our older objective of uh, imparting higher education, imparting you knowledge, every bit of information to you is the same, wishes are new and with these wishes, uh, uh, we take a pledge to give you more and more knowledge uh, through these uh, Edusat lectures. So, dear friends, uh, uh, taking this lecture forward, I would like to tell you all uh, that uh, today we would be discussing on the play called The Duckies of Malfi by by John Webster and uh, for this discussion on uh, John Webster's The Duckies of Malfi, we have once again with us in our studios, Professor Anand Prakash. Professor Anand Prakash uh, is a retired uh, professor from uh, Delhi University from a uh, department of uh, English and uh, through these uh, Edusit network, um, he has always uh, tried to rope us all uh, in a single network uh, and uh, I believe that uh, his experience uh, as well as um, his uh, passion towards the, uh, these lectures would help us to know more and more. So without wasting any time, I would uh, like to welcome once again our guest, Professor Anand Prakash. Professor Prakash, welcome to the Edisit lecture and first of all, a very, very happy new year to you. Thank you, Geetika and the same uh, wish to you also and uh, viewers, welcome uh, for, to this discussion. And uh, <clears throat> um, I wish you also a very happy, productive, intellectually exciting new year because one has to learn a lot of things and I keep learning almost on a daily basis. So let's all, you know, be a part of this project of learning together in the new year that we are starting with today. Now the topic as has been announced is uh, John Webster's Duchess of Malfi. Now <clears throat> obviously uh, uh, Webster is not as well known as some of the others that we have discussed. And uh, he lived in Shakespeare's time, a little later than Shakespeare. He was a junior to Shakespeare. He also may have assisted Shakespeare in the writing of his plays at uh, one point of time. Uh, he began his career in the beginning of the uh, 16th, uh, 17th century and then of course went on. Now, it's not that he's a minor playwright. It's also not that uh, you know uh, he has not contributed much to the growth of our, our dramatic writing in English. Uh, well, uh, he is uh, much more than others a product of his times. Now Shakespeare also was a product of his time, but he was of the bigger time, the larger time. Shakespeare, you know, was produced, let's say, uh, by the entire Renaissance ethos, not just England. But in the case of uh, Webster, one can say that there are uh, pressures on him which emanate from his society and Europe in general, and that then he gets back to his work and with uh, much more seriousness and focus than many others. Uh, his range is not very wide, but then he writes a different kind of a play because he lived in different circumstances. Now, when I say that he's a Shakespeare's contemporary and that he wrote at the time Shakespeare was alive and then continued the tradition after Shakespeare's death, uh, well, uh, about that later, but then uh, there is a kind of change that has occurred in the writing of drama in English in the post-Shakespearean period. Shakespeare, you know, would use blank words, uh, which this person also uh, largely would use. Uh, Shakespeare would use the folk tale. Here, uh, there is some kind of difference. Uh, uh, John Webster may not use exactly the folk tale. Web, uh, uh, Shakespeare would keep the popular uh, you know, audience in mind, uh, the, the, the audience, you know, which would appreciate his plays. Webster may be a difficult play to, uh, you know, a difficult playwright to make sense of. But then if you uh, uh, hear or uh, read him, if you uh, see him on the stage, uh, you realize that he has some very important things to share with the audience. And those important things belong to the second, the first and second decades of the 17th century. What has changed uh, at the time, you know, when Shakespeare uh, leaves the stage, is there, uh, you know, in London and uh, goes to uh, Stratford upon Avon and comes back. What has changed in England in the 17th question, uh, 17th century is the question that uh, one can, you know, beautifully discuss. And I would say that uh, the kind of, uh, you know, enthusiasm, the kind of passion, the kind of excitement that was there in Tudor England 
that was waning, that was you know uh, weakening uh, in in the early years of the 17th century, and uh, as uh, has been suggested by many, and uh, I also touched upon this topic in my previous lectures, uh, Shakespeare himself too did not remain as optimistic a genius, as optimistic a mind as he was in the uh, latter part of the uh, you know 16th century, and uh, then you know around 1610. When the regime of the new king, King James I, stabilizes, then people start looking inwards. Then they want to know as to how things are happening within them, which are weakening them, which are disintegrating them. And there is a different kind of, of an air in England at that time. And uh, well, what is generally called Jacobian drama, as against Elizabethan drama, of which Shakespeare was the pillar. In Jacobian drama, different issues are emerging, and these issues are difficult to comprehend. You uh, cannot straight away say, well, this is what life was. Now, I will not dilate on this in philosophical terms or critical terms. I will just take certain examples from the play, from, from characters, etc., and then we will uh, you know, uh, talk about the issues that he raises. Now, uh, <clears throat> when you read this play, you realize that the characters are not part of a plot in the sense in which Shakespeare would make them a part of the plot. There is a plot, of course. There is a beginning, there is a middle, there is an end. An action begins. It raises certain hopes, certain doubts, certain apprehensions. Those apprehensions then are sought to be captured later in the middle of the play. And towards the end, there is some kind of a resolution. So that plot is there. At the same time, uh, there is no uh, proper sequence of the story that you know uh, makes the play interesting. This play is not interesting. It's very challenging. It's a play that raises questions and, you, and you, are, you are kept wondering as to what the author says. And when you realize that this is what the author says, then you feel internally disturbed. And it's a very disturbing play. Uh, I, I raised the question right in the beginning. Uh, when I was looking uh, at it, I edited this book and I, I, I you know, uh, uh, for, the, for the students of Delhi University. And there I, uh, well, intensively read it. Uh, but when I went back to it, then once again, this question got uh, you know raised uh, uh, while I was having a look at it. Why is it that in Duchess of Malfi, the play, there is a character who is of course uh, quite important in his own way, uh, is the first character to be listed, and that person is not uh, Duchess of Malfi. It's not any of the important characters, and the character who is mentioned is Bosola. There's a character called Bosola, and who is this Bosola? What role does he have to play in the, uh, in, in, in the drama that we are discussing? This is the question I once again started thinking about. I, of course, saw the answer in the book, it, book itself. But then I was wondering as to why Bosola is kept in the beginning of the play. And then I thought that perhaps the author is uh, taking from some kind of history a writer, a, a, a character who belongs to the age itself, who belongs to, let's say, the, the, the 1610, 1611, 1612, when the play is being composed. Who is this Postula and what is he doing in the play? This question, you know, you also, if you read the uh, play, you, 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 you will face this question. And my answer uh, to this would be that Bosola is the new man that has emerged in England. This man has not come from the upper classes. This person is a, is a kind of a, a careerist. He is a, he's an intelligent person, but he is also cynical. He is a sad person. He is a person with some sense of melancholy in his mind. He has dark imagination. He is a, he, he is a very professional uh, sort of an individual. You give him a task and he will do it. He is very much career minded. Why is a uh, jobster making such a character stand at the top of the list of characters whom he will use in the play is the question. And my answer is that uh, Webster wants to keep this play rooted in the contemporary background. And that a new kind of person, a new kind of section of people, a new kind of class has emerged in England, which is neither from the upper classes nor from the lower classes. And these people are very sad. Not just sad, they are melancholic and they are very, at the same time, pessimistic and almost devilish. Now, when I say pessimistic and devilish, then I would tell you, uh, viewers, that it's a very deadly combination. If somebody, is a passive, uh, 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 if somebody is a passive person, somebody doesn't want to work, somebody has no interest in the work, and at the same time one is intelligent, so intelligent in pessimism, and the third is that he has no sense of values. Just, just give him anything and, and, and he will carry it out. And when you ask him, 
as to why yeah, he, he, he is uh, you know, uh, raising these questions, then his answer would be, well, I'm a professional. So a new class of professional has emerged in England. And Webster is putting this class at the center of the play. This class will actually carry out all the instructions of others. They, are, they don't have a personality of their own. Uh, now, uh, uh, imagine when I was uh, editing this play, uh, then I, uh, you know, uh, I mentioned this in, in, my, in my introduction, uh, introductory essay. And, and I also discussed in the class, do we also have in India a kind of a class which is professional in nature, which doesn't have any role to play except the role of one's, one's career? Uh, you know, uh, most of us uh, study in order to get a job. Uh, if somebody asks, what do you want to do in life? And they say, we want to get a job. And you say, why a job? And then the answer that is given is, because we need money. And we need money for, for, for marriage, for owning a house, for, for, for you know, competing with others. This is the kind of question that, that, that people generally you know, uh, uh, discuss and answer uh, in terms that I've already uh, told you. So uh, this class has no role to play except that to make one's career. And there are millions and millions of people in the modern world who just live life because they have to get a job because they have to make money, because they have to succeed in life. So if you succeed in life, you are making money, then there is a kind of a role that you are not playing. The role which, is, uh, which can be called you know, contributing to the growth of society, to the progress of society, to the creation of certain ideas, creation of certain ideals. You know, uh, uh, th th this is a question that uh, we, we should face in, in, in our situation also. Uh, in the early 90s and early 20th century, no Indian worth one's name, would ever say that he is meant to do a job, that you, that you are born to do a job, that you are born to be uh, a clerk, an administrator, a teacher, this and that, etc., and that you will earn money out of it. But you ask Bosola, and Bosola is the first person, in fact, one of the first in English literature, uh, who, you know, uh, will not have any aim in life, any mission in life. He would not like to change circumstances for the better. He is not an idealist, and he is not a, even a realist. He's, he, he's a melancholy person, a sad person, a person with dark imagination, a person who will carry out anything you want. So it's a kind of a stick wielder. Well, the stick wielder is there, the person has very good health. You go to him and say, okay, I, I want to get this person beaten, how much money will you take? And the person says, I'll take maybe 5,000 rupees. So there are you know, contract killers also in society. These people are there, they, they, they carry guns and they are, they are quite equipped you know, with the skills uh, to, to uh, you know, do the wishes that, that, that the employer, that the paymaster tells them to do. So Bosola is such a person. So an intelligent person with skills and who could be a character and who would think, who would feel, who would become different after some time, this character is there in the play and when any kind of violence has to happen in the play, that will happen in the hands of Bosola. Bosola is not doing it for himself, he is doing it for money. So right in the beginning, the, the, the person is introduced, he comes and meets on the third or fourth page of the play, and there, you know, as, as somebody says, why are you looking so sullen? And he says, I want a promotion. So he wants a promotion, and, and once you give him the promotion, he'll be somewhat happy, or at least less unhappy. So I, I was wondering as to why uh, Webster brought this character in, and later on gave him such a destructive role. And uh, well, the, the person uh, has to get, get the pay and he's a professional. He, he's very honest regarding his work. You give him the work, he'll do it. But he, he, he'll also at the same time uh, demand, you know, a right amount of money to do it. So when these people are there, which, which, in, uh, which, which in Hindi would be called hatyaras, you know, they, they, their job is to kill, their job is to destroy. Uh, professionally do whatever you want them to do. Uh, uh, viewers, don't we have such a class in our in a society? We have, you know, there are administrators whose job is not to, uh, you know, uh, tell uh, what, what, what uh, uh, you know, they, they want. Their job is to just tell you what others have employed them for. And when, and when these people are there, they of course are requirements of society, but they themselves as individuals don't have a kind of character that is expected of, let's say, the Renaissance man, for instance. So uh, I thought I should, I, I should give this introductory point in the beginning so that you can know the perspective of the play. The play is about the Duchess of Malfi. I'll uh, briefly tell you the story, if there is a story in the play, which is uh, very, very minimal. Duchess of Malfi is a young woman, a beautiful young woman, belonging to the upper classes. She has already become a widow, and she has two brothers of the same age as she. And these three uh, are a kind of trio in the play, 
and they remain at the center. Now the two brothers are all the time ranged against her. They don't want her to pursue her uh, wishes, or pursue her urges. Uh, she, she, she is a sister, she, she, she is a beautiful young woman and she, she is a, a widow. So uh, the brothers will tell her what she should do. And very clearly in the first few pages, in the first act itself, the brothers lay out the terms of her life in such clear terms that it's bone chilling. Uh, a brother says, I'm telling you, you should not marry. And then she says, okay, I'll not marry. Then the other, bro uh, other brother says, no, no, you are a beautiful woman and you have your urges and you might marry and you might meet somebody. Now don't talk smilingly to anybody because the, when, when a person you know, smiles to, uh, to, uh, you know, to, to you and talks to you, then you might uh, become tempted to, to join him and to marry him. And she says, I'll not do it. Then, then the first person once again comes back, the brother says, no, no, but you have to be sure. And if you do it, then you will have to pay for the consequences. What are the consequences? The brothers are very clear. They are the masters of the family. They are the people uh, at whose mercy everybody, including their sister, exists in the play. So if she marries against the wishes of her brothers, then, uh, well, uh, she, she, she will have to pay uh, for this with her life. She will be killed. So right in the beginning, the plan is laid out that a sister is not allowed to be married by her brothers uh, to, 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 to anyone uh, of her choice or what, and that she has only to live according to the instructions of their brother. This is one part. The second part also is made very clear right in the beginning. The woman wants to marry. The brothers know it. The brothers can, can you tell from her demeanor, uh, can, can, uh, tell from her appearance, tell from her face that she has some kind of an urge to join with a man and she is young and she has those urges. Now what's wrong if there is a young woman, uh, a, a widow, who wants to marry, who wants to remarry? What's wrong in this? It is, it is, it's a right she, and she belongs to the upper classes. I don't think they are there. That way, uh, uh, you know, are denied that freedom uh, to, to marry, they are not. And then she will be guided by her own desires, wishes and urges. It's a woman. If it were a man, then nobody would bother. And this is, this is the 70th century. In fact, the two brothers also have some kind of an equation with women. And, and, and they go about it uh, with, with, without any qualms of conscience. So the brothers can you know, uh, indulge in, in, in this kind of an activity, if, I, if I, I can use the word indulge. They are carrying on affairs with women. And so one of them is carrying an affair with the wife of uh, you know, a, a, a person in the court and the husband also knows it, but nobody can do anything about it. So the brothers themselves can carry on uh, affairs with women and they are denying a kind of the right of sexuality to their sister. This is how the play begins. Will the play go anywhere? Can it go anywhere? The, 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 the men are very powerful. Uh, they have all the rights that, and uh, because uh, the Duchess of Malfi is a widow and uh, well she, she has to uh, sustain herself only with the support that she gets from her brothers. Therefore, she doesn't have that kind of a right which the males enjoy. So the first thing that a woman in the 17th century has a kind of sexuality. Now this question is very important in, in England in the 17th century because women Christian women, and all, 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 all people are Christians uh, in Europe at that point of time, they don't have to indulge in any pleasures. And uh, there is a very strict moral code which is supposed to govern the behavior of women. And in Christianity, marriage is only to, you know, uh, produce children. Marriage is only to, to, to contribute uh, citizens to the, uh, to the number of uh, uh, people in society. And uh, well, th that's the only purpose they have. So they are producers of of the, of, of, the, uh, the, the, uh, of the progeny, they, they, they are producers of children and that is all. And in some of the sermons that have been quoted by feminist critics uh, in, uh, you know, uh, about the uh, circumstance in the uh, you know, uh, 17th century, then the sermons say that you know, uh, sexual pleasure in marriage is completely avoided, avoided because it is anti-Christian, it is anti-principles of God. Therefore, you are not a Christian if you seek any kind of pleasures from physical intimacy. So these are the kind of, you know, uh, points of atmosphere that surround uh, the, the, the widow here and uh, uh, Dr. Malfi uh, has to, uh, you know, look all around before she can even think of indulging in such pleasures. And uh, well, Shakespeare has deliberately chosen 
uh, Italy to be the background of this play because there are some kinds of streams of thought are going on clashing with one another. And one of the one of the thoughts is that, well, human beings are basically uh, toys in the hands of the moral structures. They don't have a body. They don't have a mind of their own. Human beings are merely tools through which certain moral structures are supposed to be established and strengthened. So this is the kind of philosophical, this is the kind of ideological, you know, play that is going on in, in Italy in particular and Europe in general. And uh, Webster is taking this point from the philosophical to the actual angle. This, this is the first point that I make and this is about Desert of Malfi. Now, uh, <clears throat> with whom is Desert of Malfi want to marry, uh, wants, wants to marry, this is the question. And uh, well, uh, she is a very strong woman. She knows her mind, she knows her body, she, she knows her preferences. And she knows that you know, she can tackle these people and, uh, uh, to, to a certain extent. And she has decided to marry a person below her, beneath her in status. So, so there is a kind of steward in, in the family and he's a handsome young man. And uh, well, uh, he uh, uh, spends time with her, she spends time with him and she has fallen in love with him. He also likes her. And uh, very soon in the first act itself, these two people, decide to marry uh, away from the gaze of others uh, you know, in, in a room and the only witness to their marriage is the maid that lady, uh, the, the, that uh, Desert of Malfi has. And uh, there, you know, uh, there is a kind of, uh, you know, dialogue structure between the beloved and the lover and that dialogue structure we can uh, compare with Shakespeare's lovers, for instance, but then there is a total difference. I started the discussion uh, by saying, you know, there is a different kind of a play. And then I realized that uh, uh, certain dialogues that the characters speak in the play, those dialogues don't seem to convey anything to the other person. As if, you know, the person is talking, but the person is talking to oneself, to himself or herself. And that, in a way, all dialogues are a uh, practice in expressing oneself rather than a practice in communicating it uh, to others, you know, one's point of view. I'll just present a few dialogues to you viewers and, and, and then you can make up your own mind regarding the uh, the, the truth, the, the desirability and the significance of these dialogues. For instance, uh, <clears throat> I'll speak from um, uh, the, the first uh, part itself. Antonio, the, the lover, the, the, the steward in the, in the family of uh, Duchess of Malfi, he says this to her, I will remain the constant sanctuary of your good name. This is not a dramatic dialogue in the sense in which we are aware, we, we are familiar with, with, with dialogues. What does it mean? It's, it's, it's a very difficult sentence. I will remain the constant sanctuary of your good name. Of course, the meaning, as, as you uh, look at it the second time, is clear that he will all the time uh, think of her honor. He will not uh, you know, uh, try her, her honor to be compromised in any way. And uh, a lover is talking of uh, the giving such a dialogue means that he is a thinker. And, and, and he, he knows that his job is to, uh, you know, bring a good name to the, to, to the woman. He is her servant and therefore he will not allow uh, the, the affair to be known to others unnecessarily so that people look down on her and say that he has married, uh, she has married him beneath his uh, family. And then what does the Duchess say? See the, the uh, uh, beloved who is saying this to him, I thank you, gentle love, and because you shall not come to me in debt, being now my steward, here upon your lips I sign your quietest. There is a, there's a Latin word here that is, okay, this was your obligation and the obligation is complete. Is this, is this the dialogue of a, of, of a beloved? Not at all. She has not shown any kind of feeling. Uh, the, the only thing is she says that uh, she is in debt to him and that uh, initially he was her steward, but now she puts on his lips a sign. So she kisses him uh, on the stage and then that is all. Why is she talk, talking like this? Why is not able to uh, you know, uh, give expression to her feelings very clearly, very spontaneously? Well, th th there can be many reasons. One reason is that it's a woman and then she is shy and that uh, she is marrying, this, marrying the second time, uh, which is not uh, approved of by, by a large number of people. Therefore, she has to be of fewer words. At the same time, you notice that in this dialogue, Antonio speaks only one and, a half, one and a half lines, a very short sentence, and the woman, in fact, spoke more. Why? Why is Webster, you know, telling us that even though the woman is shy 
and, 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 and the man is slightly inhibited in his talk, and yet the woman talks more. The reason perhaps is that because of her higher station, she is able to gather better confidence than the man. And in any case, uh, a mature woman, uh, a woman of, you know, uh, a, an adult woman, a woman uh, uh, just approaching her middle age, she will have better knowledge of her desires, better knowledge of herself, and she'll be more bold. And if she is not bold, the servant will never come up to her expectations. Therefore, she is able to come out of herself and make a statement about love. So she is not expressing emotions, she is not expressing feelings, she is making a statement about love and this statement has many ramifications. This is a statement that she is making to the lover. This is a statement that is she, she is making about her state, about her condition in society where she lives. She is a statement that, that, that she is going to uh, make to herself that she is taking a decision and since she is taking a decision, therefore she has to pay for the consequences of the decision. So the last part that she is making a statement uh, about her uh, to, uh, for her own benefit so that she can tell herself that she took, took this step and that nobody seduced her, or no, no, nobody you know, uh, compelled her to do anything and at the same time because she is making a statement, she is making it clear to herself and to others that she has her own body and she, she reserves the right to it. She won't allow her brothers to own this body and, 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 and to tell the world, etc., that they are, you know, suppressing her sexuality. So, in a way, a new kind of woman is born in the, uh, in, in the post-Elizabethan uh, Jacobian period who is uh, mature, uh, who is uh, surrounded by all kinds of uh, uh, restrictions, uh, enemies, uh, uh, unhelpful uh, uh, brothers. She has no protection from anywhere. And uh, whatever protection she might have had from her social station, uh, that protection is taken away from her because she is a widow and there is nobody to defend her. And uh, well, uh, if people you know, uh, somehow plan her assassination, her killing, then she would have nobody who can really uh, save her from this kind of a fate. In that situation, the woman is making a statement to herself that she will live life on her own terms. This is what I said that there is a new class is born. And maybe in, in that sense, she is closer to Bosola than to her brothers. Bosola is sincere. He, he is destructive. Uh, the, the, that person I talked about, the, the, the professional, he is a murderer, all those things. But if he has to murder, he knows what he is doing. He wants money. You give him the money and he will murder. And well, I will not go further into it, but then tell you that right in the beginning, one of the brothers, Ferdinand, uh, the, 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 the elder brother, he has actually appointed Bosola to keep a watch on her, a professional you know, assassin, a professional murderer and an intellectual and a well-educated person, a person who knows about others and know, knows about himself. He talks to himself, Bosola, sometimes, which means that he is a kind of philosopher. This person is given a job by the brother uh, in, in the house of his sister, uh, that, that is Lady, uh, that is uh, uh, Duchess of Malfi. So he will keep a watch on her all the time. And if she somehow uh, goes against the wishes and the instructions of her brother, then he will go and inform him. So this is also there. So viewers, uh, uh, in this kind of situation, can a woman live? And if you, if you, you know, uh, go uh, you know, slightly off this, then realize that women have always lived like this. They have always been under the, uh, not supervision and protection, but under the oppressive uh, you know, structure that the brothers and fathers and others have built for them. And they have survived. And sometimes they cross the moral boundaries, but they know that the moral boundaries are not drawn by them. They are drawn by others. So if they are not drawn by them, they are, then they are not supposed to agree with them. So this is the kind of fate that women have. The only thing in this play is that such a woman is allowed to come to the stage, come on the stage, talk to the audience, show to the audience that she is her own master and that she will do what she wants to do. So, uh, well, uh, Geetika, would you like to add, add something to this? That this kind of fate is, is visualized and anticipated by, uh, you know, uh, Webster in the early part of the 17th century itself, which is a good 400 years before now. 
definitely sir you are absolutely right over here as we have talked earlier uh, in earlier sessions also that um, how uh, the various um, uh, writers um, the play writers or the authors have uh, predicted uh, the situations uh, uh, beforehand uh, uh, i mean many centuries before uh, definitely uh, he uh, might have uh, predicted in advance that um, uh, what would be the fate of the women and the um, and the i would say that the negative part of it is that though uh, the time is changing though women are becoming more empowered though they ha have uh, more rights but still uh, the situations persist still we find them uh, what they, uh, it was there in the past and we learn quite a bit you know from from them and uh, that learning can be in fact useful for us in the sense you know that now we can think of the structures in which we have put ourselves and particularly the women so these women because th they come from the upper classes and and they have a sense of dignity uh, which, which, which which they should uh, you know maintain so they will uh, come forward they, they they'll fight with the social structures with the families and and, and and with powerful people there and they would like to have their way if they cannot have their way then they'll pay the price but they'll gladly do so and uh, you know uh, uh, in a play uh, it's not that somebody is uh, compelling uh, this or that character to come forward and you know uh, talk directly but that there'll be hired people who will do the job of suppressing others and one person has been hired already in the family and this person is there 24 hours in the house of uh, uh, this is Malfi and is keeping a watch on her and that person is a professional. He is an intelligent person. You can't deceive him. You try to deceive him and he will see your motive very clearly. Now I, let me tell you uh, at this stage the level of understanding of this character called Bosala, uh, you know whom I already introduced. Uh, <coughs> when he gets a job from Ferdinand he is very happy that finally <coughs> you know his labor has been bought and that this person can now carry out the wishes of his employer. Now this person is loyal to the employer only and is very clear that he is he's, he's, he's loyal to the employer because uh, the, the, the employer can afford uh, money for him. If he, if he could not give him money then he, he would go to another employer and then he might work against Ferdinand himself. And when uh, <coughs> Ferdinand has given him a job then this is what Bosola says. I am I'm, I'm explaining this because uh, uh, Duchess of Malfi will live in the presence of this person all the time and how she will be able to avoid you know his attention uh, avoid his gaze how she would carry on uh, the, the affair of marriage now uh, with, with, with Antonio uh, this is a task that, that she, has, she has to fulfill and whether she can perform this task properly successfully is the question is the kind of you know uh, uh, curiosity that the audience would have. Uh, I, I just uh, give this dialogue to you for, for consideration and see how uh, you know uh, it uh, uh, throws light on the nature of atmosphere in which uh, Duchess of Malfi is supposed to live and breathe. I would have you curse yourself now, he is talking to his master, to, to his employer, that your bounty which makes men truly noble, you are giving so much of money to me, ever should make me a villain. Because your bounty, bounty, the salary that you are giving me, the money that you are giving me, actually is the money given in order to perform the job of a villain, the job of a person who will keep a watch on the woman. Uh, the moment she, uh, you know, flouts the wishes, uh, he'll just go and inform her brother. This is what she has done. She has, she has married. Now uh, take whatever step. So you are giving money, and with this money, you have already turned me into a villain. Who can say this? Employers, employed cannot say this. Because they say, okay, well, this is our job and we have to perform it. But then he knows that he is being given a job which is negative in nature. Now, uh, why I brought in the question of administration? When somebody administers in society, then that administration uh, doesn't give any scope to the administrator to be creative. Administrator's job is to carry out. And the wishes are, are of the employer, not, not, not of his own. So there is a kind of cynicism about it. You are, you are doing it because you are getting money out of it, not that you want it, not that you approve of it. And this person says, because you are giving me a villainous job, so I will carry it out. You are giving me good money and I will uh, pay you back you know, in, in terms of the, the work that, that, that I am supposed to perform. Therefore, you have given me, given me the job of a villain. So you have already turned me into a villain. Oh, that to avoid ingratitude for the good deed you have done me. I can't avoid the gratitude. I'll be happy with you. Uh, I'll be beholden to you. Uh, you are giving me money, therefore I'll be honest with you. I must do all the ill man can invent. 
you have made an, made an ill man out of me, so I'll invent everything. I'll, I'll, I'll you know, uh, in this sense, be creative in order to meet your desires and requirements. This is the kind of mind. First state intelligence, the person knows he's, given, uh, he's being given something that is against his grain, that is against the grain of others, but then he's getting money out of it. Why should he not do it? So it's a very, it's a very powerful play in the sense, you know, that it makes us aware about our own role in life. If my role in life is to, well, uh, give wrong information to others, to give an information, to give a knowledge which I don't agree with, uh, the, the, log the logic of which, uh, with, with which I don't agree, and that logic, suppose I have to share, uh, maybe, you know, I'm a, uh, I'm a news reporter, maybe I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an analyst, maybe I'm an economist, and, and my employer is a, is, a, is a person who wants to move, uh, make more and more profit. And he's telling me, prove me, prove to me uh, that, that, you know, I'm right and the world is wrong. And the person, because he has to uh, give a wrong kind of, uh, you know, interpretation to the policy, therefore, the person is selling his labor, selling his intellectual labor in order to, uh, you know, explain things which he doesn't agree with. So, Bosola is that kind of an intellectual. And straight away, you know, we can identify ourselves with Bosola because many of us in the classroom, many of us in our policies, many of us in, in our writing, uh, you, you have writers, you know, uh, who, who write because uh, they want to be successful. And for success, you know, one has to uh, say the titillating things. Maybe a titillation give, gives, gives wrong views to the young people and, and uh, you know, a ten negative tendencies in society develop because of the, the writing of titillation, uh, you know, in, in literature and all. But then the money compels the, the writer to give a writing, to produce a writing, which the writer may not like to write, but has to because one has to make money out of it. So uh, the best minds in society are the ones, you know, who are hired by people with money, and then the, these best minds are used in order to support or oppose those, you know, with whom uh, the, the person doing so has no personal grouse has no personal, personal grudge. And still, you know, one does it because one is paid for it. And uh, Bosola saying this, I, I, I would repeat it again, I would have you curse yourself now. Please curse yourself now, you are giving me money, that your bounty which makes men truly noble ever should make me a villain. And that to avoid ingratitude for the good deed you have done me by giving me my, my money and raising, you know, uh, my, my, my payment, my pay packet, I must do all the ill man can invent. So from now onwards in the play, I'll be doing all the wrong things, all the bad things. What is the bad thing he's doing? That he'll keep a watch on the Duchess and each movement of the Duchess within the house will be, will be reported to her enemy, her brother, and that finally uh, this person will be her killer. So this is the point, this is the plot and uh, let me tell you further that very soon the uh, brothers will come to know through Bosola that, that she has already married and uh, later on, you know, some time passes and, and she has children also and nobody knows that she has children. And uh, then those children grow up, they are three. And uh, a few years later, then the, wo the, the woman is, uh, you know, uh, imprisoned, sort of imprisoned. And then uh, she is, uh, you know, uh, 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 she is tortured uh, in, in the house and, uh, you know, uh, mad people are set after her and she is surrounded by mad people all through. So that you know, she can lose her wits and she can become mad herself. So the, this kind of a torture is being, uh, you know, uh, given to her and through Bosola. So Bosola also can use, you know, different masks in order to torture her further. And later on, at the end, the three children will be killed. The, uh, the uh, husband also will be killed. And finally, Duchess uh, 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 of Malfi too will be killed. And the killer of all of them directly would be Bosola. And uh, you know, this, this, and uh, finally, a very beautiful life of a woman is, is, is you know, uh, uh, that, that, that is made to, uh, you know, disappear from the scene. This is the kind of play that Duchess uh, of Malfi is. But then, the great thing about this play is <coughs> that till the end, Duchess of Malfi does not give in. She doesn't give up. See, she fights and she fights to the finish and she is loyal to her husband <coughs> and, and, uh, and you can see that there is a kind of sympathy and pity uh, for, for, the, for the woman, for her children and for her husband and that these devils, you know, uh, that the two brothers who are torturing her and Bosola. Now, uh, that, that's also an interesting fact that so far as the two brothers are concerned, uh, the, the elder brother particularly, Ferdinand, 
uh, th th this this brother uh, himself goes mad, and uh, his madness is of a very cruel kind, and 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 that cruelty is that he thinks he is an animal, and therefore he starts behaving as an animal on the stage. What is uh, uh, the author doing by showing this character uh, in, in this kind of a dangerous, in this kind of a self-destructive form? Uh, viewers, you can, you can think of this question. My answer to this would be that if you are doing wrong things, if you are suppressing a person, if you are being cruel to her, if you are inventing with the help of hired assassins and, and experts you know, in, in, in torture, uh, you, you, you are asking these people to torture the person, then finally your own mind gets affected by it. So the policies you make, the, the principles you pursue, the, the, the uh, uh, steps you take in order to uh, crush others, those things uh, work on your mind also. And when they work on your mind, then you cease to be human, you cease to be kind, you become pro cruel yourself. So an assassin becomes assassin also at the level of one's mind. And uh, because they are planning it and they are paying for it to others, therefore they are not human beings at all. So in fact, in this negative way, this is a play uh, which will be a humanist play. It is where the human, the human qualities are, are becoming, becoming weaker and weaker uh, in the case of the two brothers. And finally, the elder brother turns into an animal. And uh, this kind of a horror uh, is shown to the audience on the stage. And when you see the horror, you realize that perhaps, uh, you know, this kind of a life takes away all good qualities from life. So this is the kind of uh, message that finally gets, uh, gets across to the audience that there is a play which has violence and that violence is sickening at the same time that violence makes us conscious about our, our own drawbacks and uh, compels us to th rethink about the violent means that we might sometimes adopt in life. Now, uh, <clears throat> I'll just talk about these characters. Uh, one, uh, Bosola I have talked about in some detail. Now, let, let's think of other characters and, this, and the plan, you know, under which the division of characters has happened in this play. The family at the center of, uh, in, in, in the play consists of the Duchess, a widow, Ferdinand and Cardinal, who are the brothers. So, it's a, uh, as I said in the beginning, it is three characters and they remain at the center of the play. So far as the uh, uh, Duchess is concerned, she is a picture of, uh, you know, uh, uh, dignity. She is a picture of uh, strength and uh, the strength and dignity actually makes other people uh, very self-conscious about, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the uh, plans that they, they uh, uh, have, they, they have hatched in life. And uh, the brighter she shines, the darker the other people become. So you have that center of quality, you have that center of, you know, uh, 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 good principles in, 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 in the play and uh, this uh, uh, good principle uh, is uh, a kind of a yardstick against which the worth of other characters in the play can be measured and once you have the uh, duchess at the center of the play then you then you know the respective uh, uh, value of each character uh, who is there in the play for instance ferdinand her brother is, is, is a picture of evil is a picture of cruelty is, is a picture of brutality there is this other brother <coughs> who is a cardinal. He is he's, he's, he's very close to religion. And uh, even though he is close to religion, he is he's, he's, uh, very devious. So, uh, well, uh, at the level of uh, uh, being a brother, uh, the, the, this person uh, takes part in all the torture that, that, that is given to the sister. And at another level, he also becomes the reflection on the office that he holds. A religious person uh, doing all these things uh, becomes much more hypocritical than one, you know, who is actually normally living in life. So you have uh, a good attack, a very sound attack on uh, the, the office of the, the Christians uh, at that point of time. And uh, Webster is uh, taking help from the uh, Italian background, but such, you know, uh, uh, officers uh, in, the, in, in the church also were there in England and everybody saw them, uh, you know, in the street, moving, moving around or in the church, etc. And they were full of hatred for for these people. So you have the cardinal, the brother, the brother who will be uh, oppressing his sister and then uh, all of us are going to hate him, the audience is going to hate him and reject him and therefore uh, 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 Webster becomes a kind of a social critic here who is showing him in such dark light as I have already told you. So you have two brothers and uh, they, they, they are the more dark that the, the, that the woman shines bright. And when I say bright and when I say valuable, I don't mean in the Christian sense of the word. 
I don't mean uh, in, in, in the you know, general sense of the word, you know, that, that, that somebody is good and well, uh, is helpful and all. This woman is good because she is going against the bad people and she uh, is planning her own life in order to assert the, the right of a woman as against the uh, you know, perpetrators who, who, who are the males uh, you know, uh, in her presence. So she has that, that way uh, a, a cause to uphold, the cause is to uh, maintain her sense of dignity and, and her of, uh, maintain her sense of integrity. So these three remain at the center and uh, the one, with, with one you sympathize and, and about others you, f you feel disgusted and the place about, the, the place, the core and, and, and it's about these people only. Then you have uh, outside this particular, you know, hierarchy, the, this is the top uh, section in society, in, in, in the play. After that you have people like Antonio, who is the steward and he is, a, he is an officer in, in the palace of, of Duchess of Malfi, but then he is beneath her and uh, he is a lover. And as a lover, he has qualities. As a, as, as, as a, as a, as a person in, in, the, uh, in the palace also he has qualities. And uh, since he is a choice, uh, he, he, uh, he has been chosen as a husband, as, as a lover uh, by, by uh, the Duchess. Therefore, uh, this person outshines everybody else among the males. He is, he's, you know, in a way living for his ideals. He is uh, performing the role of a husband. He is uh, performing the role of a protector. He is performing the role of giving love to his wife. He gives her understanding and appreciation. He is a good father. So you have, uh, uh, there, there is a family which is outside this family. That family is of the two brothers and the sister. And there is a family in front of this family. And that is of uh, Antonio, that is of Malfi and the children. Um, but you can see, you know, that this other family, the family which has children, etc., this is surrounded from all sides by torturers and people who, uh, you know, um, uh, give punishment to uh, the ones, you know, who are meek and who are humble. Then you have uh, <coughs> a kind of nobility in the play, Silvio, Castruccio, Rodrigo, Grisolan, these are the Italian nobility in the play, and uh, they are in the court of Ferdinand, and uh, they, they always move around him. Now, so far as uh, their dialogues are concerned, uh, they also speak very little. They only speak, you know, having a look at the, the, the uh, you know, face of the, uh, 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 face of Ferdinand. If he wants to hear, then they will say it. If he doesn't want to hear good things or bad things, then they will not say it. So, which means they are basically uh, are doing that only, which uh, somehow suits their master. It's a very unnatural kind of a state. Actually, uh, when I was looking at the play from the point of view of what the author wanted to say, I realized that uh, Webster was talking about a time when the old structures of the of the court were were disintegrating. Uh, you know, the, there was a structure in in the 16th century in England and and all over Europe. That structure, you know, uh, held itself uh, strong uh, on the basis of uh, the uh, ownership of the land and ownership of the uh, and, and and the crown and the rights of the king and the court. And uh, a large army had to be kept, and this army had to be managed by the king. And uh, there will be sometimes, you know, uh, 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 conditions of uh, instability in the country. Then the people will be, you know, uh, punished by the army. And when uh, another country fought with the one in which the king lived, then there will be a war outside. So that was the system. And uh, the whole thing, you know, uh, uh, flowed from the office of the king. This, that system, which, is, which could, could be called the monarchical system or before that the feudal system, that system finally has become irrelevant to the conditions in Europe in the latter half of the 16th century and the first half of the 17th century. So this system is, is shown to be rotten at its core, rotten at, at, at its roots. And that rot can be seen in the behavior of the two brothers, in, in the behavior of Bosola, in the behavior of others, because uh, if, if, if they are rotting, then uh, some other system has to emerge. What the system is, nobody knows. If the system is not clear and the old one is rotting, then you are all the time filled with a kind of melancholy. That's why there is melancholy in the play. The melancholy is at the wrong place. It's there in the mind of Bosola. But then Bosola is a part of this life. And if you see Bosola, then you don't see him as a character. You see him as the truth of the circumstance that surrounds England or that surrounds Europe or that surrounds Italy to be precise so far as this play is concerned. Uh, if that is concerned, then this is uh, actually a lesson about the times in which John Webster is 
uh, practicing the art of drama uh, for himself. So you have these characters. Uh, <coughs> uh, they are uh, they sometimes appear on the stage. <coughs> they talk to uh, Ferdinand and uh, uh, his, his brother Silvio, Castruccio, Rodrigo, Grisolan, and uh, their role is only to agree with the boss, and they all the time agree with the boss whether the boss is wrong or right. And so far as the play is concerned, it's uh, the boss is always wrong. And that is a kind of, you know, uh, if you can see boldness in, in, in uh, Duchess of Malfi uh, viewers, then you must see that there is a boldness in the writer also. The writer also draws a clear line of distinction between the dark and the white, the black and the white. He is not making any gray, uh, you know, uh, on, on the stage. He is not presenting any, any situation of the gray where things are mixed. Things are not mixed. They are either right or wrong. And the right and wrong are posed against each other. And the choice is very clear for the audience to take. So you have uh, uh, Duchess of Malfi, you don't find any fault in her from the humanist angle. Otherwise, you know, from the, from, the, from the brother's point of view, she has all the faults. But from the humanist angle, she has no faults. And if she has no faults, then our sympathies will all, all the time be with her. And if she is trying to establish a house which can, which can give her happy, then that house also comes from a kind of mutuality that exists, uh, you know, uh, in, in the atmosphere, at least at the potential level. Then, you know, uh, I, uh, we are, since we are uh, approaching the uh, end of this discussion, I'll, I'll just uh, make one or two uh, you know, points regarding the conclusion. The first thing is, as I already shared with you, that it's a, it's a disintegrating order that the author is presenting. Society will not remain the same. The year in which the play is written is 1612, 1613. Uh, the play will be staged in 1614. And uh, this is the Jaco Jacobian period. And the king himself, is, is getting a lot of, uh, you know, flag, a lot of criticism uh, from the people around, from, from, from the merchant class in, in, in the country at that time. And nobody knows which side the country is moving then. So, uh, he is, uh, uh, Webster is at the helm of affairs as a, as, as a writer at a time when there is no hope in the future, the immediate future, uh, that might happen, let's say, after a few years. And therefore, the uh, sense of doom the, the, the sense of destruction is reigning supreme in the atmosphere of the play. The second point that I make is that why there is a kind of prejudice against Antonio? Because he is the lower class, because, because he is a steward, because, because you know, he, he, he has a woman who, who loves him and he also loves her, but then the woman is not allowed by the social structure to join him. Therefore, all the time as a husband he has to uh, you know, uh, remain inside uh, uh, the, the house, away from the gaze of others, and it's a kind of you know imprisonment for him. And the emo Im uh, imprisonment is stronger because it's at, the, at two levels: at the level of not showing his emotions, and at the same time saving his skin, say saving his you know uh, uh, body. And then you know, I, I come back to Bosola, and that people like Bosola, they have an inner life; they know that they are they, they are killing themselves inside, but then they accept it. And uh, Bosola, I, I thought that uh, uh, there will be a different kind of humanism in, in this play, and Bosola will, will be shown f finally as working out his uh, negative problems and come out victorious somehow and say something that is positive. But that didn't happen, and I'm glad that it did not happen because then it would have been just a, it is a, just an easy answer that you think, and then there is a change of heart. Change of heart is not the answer in society. The answer in society lies in understanding the reality in the true proportions in which it exists. And that then finally, people have to put together think as to how the, the old structure is to be replaced by something new, which is inspiring. Since that is not happening, therefore, this person will not show any rosy picture, even with respect to the possibility of change. So with this, I, I finish this. With this note, thank you, sir. Thank you so very much uh, once again uh, for uh, raising a very, very uh, interesting topic as well as an uh, interesting issue over here as we have already discussed that uh, uh, there are some things in the society which still persist uh, and the woman herself should know how to fight against uh, those um, uh, problems, I would say, those uh, odd things which persist in the society. So, dear friends, uh, with this note, we take your leave and we would be meeting again uh, very soon and would be discussing on uh, one another new topic. Till then, take care. Goodbye. Thank you, sir. Thank you so very much.